We wanted to welcome you guys back from spring break and we hope that everyone is doing all right in these times of pandemic. And if anyone needs help with anything, we're here for you. If you need feedback, if you need guidance, if you need extensions, if you need to take an incomplete, please come talk to us. And I've already received a few outlines and proposals for the final paper topic from a number of you and I was really excited and impressed by those and mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to reading more of those. So if you haven't sent a proposal or um, an outline for your final paper topic to me yet, please do that in the next few weeks. Um, if you're behind on work, try to catch up. We're more than happy to accept late work at this point. It will help you if you can get these late done. With no penalty. So we're going to start with chapter eight and go over the basics of chapter eight a little bit and answer some of your questions. Chapter eight, if you recall, is on modularity. Bob, you want to take There a were a whole variety of questions that you asked. We picked out five that seemed to get repeated at, repeatedly asked. How could we refine our understanding of modularity? What makes a module? And I think that feeds into the sort of general question I got from a lot of sides of, is there a simpler way to understand modularity? Because I think a lot of, a lot of this was complex. A lot of this went over the head for a lot of people. If we could kind of break it down and make it more simple. Mm -hmm. And that was, it was true that many of you recognize that there were too many dimensions to modularity, even in Bermudez's portrayal, and his is simpler than Fodor's. So we'll ignore Fodor altogether, at least ignore the way he does it. Poor Fodor. I think he has a dozen different marks. So what all of us, I guess, honed in on is that maybe the most important things to think about in terms of modularity are just domain specificity and informational encapsulation. Yep, and that's where people have mostly looked when they've tried to talk about modularity. Domain specificity is hard, but what it says is you, it, it sort of says it does one thing, right? It'd be like having a stereo system if there were such things anymore, and one of them is a phonograph. One of them plays records. That's a module. It does one thing, it only reads records, or a CD player only reads CDs. If you try to put other things in it, it won't work. That's a kind of domain specificity. The old, the old stereo systems were all modular systems. That is, you had a, usually a tape player of some sort, a record player, a tuner. Those were all different devices that you had to wire together. Those were modules. I had two questions that I'd singled out. One was about modularity with respect to the Shepard and Metzler 1971 mental image rotation task. And one was about language acquisition and generative grammar and modularity. So maybe yep. we could illustrate what we mean by modularity or what we interpreting Bermudez, interpreting Fodor mean by modularity a little better by appealing to those examples. The second one is very close to one that many of them raised. Why is grammar or grammatical analysis thought to be a module? And some of you, by the way, asked, was that consistent with Chomsky? It's not only consistent with Chomsky, he's the inspiration for it. Right. They go hand in hand in a sense. Modularity in the sense of parts of the brain that are closed off from one another and dedicated to specific tasks and which receive input from other modules and then do some little computational operation on it and pass it on. And also nativism in the sense that the brain comes with these modules and their processing is predetermined genetically. Yeah, you grow them. Which is the Chomsky view. It means it isn't learned, you just grow it. <laughs> right. But lots of innate things don't have to be there from the beginning. Many innate things are things that occur later. All the things that define differences between human sexualities are grown into, not born with. Right. So it's still something that's predetermined, but it's something that's predetermined, which doesn't emerge until later in the lifespan. Until later in life, yeah. Human babies don't pop out of the womb speaking full English sentences. But if you're a nativist, like Chomsky, you're going to think that the genetic basis of the neural machinery that forms the basis of our ability to acquire and process and produce language is all there at birth. That's right. That's the picture. And that's Fodor as well. We saw some compelling video evidence earlier in the course of a kind of modularity 
for language processing in the dissociation of semantic and syntactic components of language in Broca's and Wernicke's aphasia in lesion right. patients. Yeah, and one of those has to do with, for example, more word comprehension, and one of those has to do more with syntax. The Wernicke's aphasic doesn't understand any words, but they can blather on and say lots of things that look grammatically right. Yeah, they produce harmonious, prosodic, fluent language that at a distance no. sounds like it's perfectly normal. But when you tune in to the actual words they're saying, they're not really saying anything at all. It's not like they're actually producing right. meaningful speech. And in Broca's aphasia, you've got the opposite, where you've got a patient who understands the language input that they're receiving and has a coherent idea that they want to express. And when they go to express it, it's just very, very difficult to get it out. And what they end up expressing mm -hmm. conveys meaning, but it conveys meaning in a belabored way. It's disprosodic, it's not harmonious, it's not fluent. And that gets back to the reason we raise this is because you asked about understanding syntax and understanding grammar as modules. They're modules because you can maintain or lose the ability to deal with grammatical sentences, with syntactically well-formed sentences, and still have no, no meaning that gets attached to them. That's your Wernicke's aphasia. Right. So you can knock out a part of the brain when you get a lesion, when you get damage to a certain brain area, you get loss of one of these functions and perfect retention of one of the other functions, which tells us that to some degree, the brain areas are specified. And both forms of aphasics will exhibit sort of normal intelligence in getting around in the world. And of course, if these questions prompt more questions for you, or if the way that we've answered them prompts more questions, or there's something that's left to be desired in the way that we've answered these questions, we'll have a forum up for you on Thursday. And part of the function of that forum is for you to engage with us and each other's questions and to, to push us further if there's something that we haven't explained well enough that you'd like to understand more. And one thing some of, some of you did ask is, can we give other examples of cognitive modules? One example is the one we'll start working on on Thursday, which is mind reading. There's what's called a theory of mind module. We'll be back to that later. But that's one example. Another one that a couple of you actually suggested was something like dyslexia. And that's something that can be sometimes affected without affecting much of anything else. It's just scrambling. It's just a difficulty in dealing with written speech. It doesn't affect intelligence. It doesn't affect people's ability to speak or to listen. And it seems like there's a genetic component to that as well. So that's one of those nice cases where it's like, oh, there really is a, a biological component to that. Bermudez likes to say there's a biological component to the theory of mind module too, as we'll see. And he says the genetics aren't very well understood. They're so poorly understood that we don't have, don't have a clue. But it's not like there's really a, a dedicated brain area for That's theory right. of mind or mind reading. We will be back to that next week, though. I will bring up again the most compelling evidence that I know of for modularity of mind is in Nancy Conwisher's work with the fusiform gyrus or fusiform face area. My partner calls it the Nancy place, the fusiform gyrus. Um, after Nancy Conwisher. Oh yeah, the Nancy place. I think that video evidence that we've seen with that patient who she has in Japan, who yep. gets electrical stimulation right on the fusiform gyrus and starts to see faces and everything. That to me is such compelling evidence for a kind of informational specificity or, or domain specificity of that particular area in the visual pathway yep. as specified to faces. Now, to me, I imagine that we're not born with that, that it's to some degree what we focus on, that, that there's something else that has us focusing on faces from birth. We prioritize faces and that area becomes specifically tailored to processing faces. And so it's instead of being a face area, it's just a plug in what kind of detailed structure your brain wants to focus on identifying. So for example, in someone who's ASD, who's got autism spectrum disorder, their attention is going to focus on Something bugs else. or cars. So a lot of people who are ASD are able to see car headlights at night and tell you what make and model of car that is. 
students, but they see someone from one of their classes and that person says, hey, hi, how are you doing? And they have no idea who that person is. I'm like this. I see someone out of context. I see their face and it means nothing to me. But I'm able to look at car headlights at night and tell you what car that is. Or I'm able to look at bugs or birds and tell you what species of bug or bird that is, right? And I think that the fusiform gyrus is, is specified to identifying detailed visual data, but not necessarily specified to faces unless the developmental trajectory brings it to that. And of course, it does happen that many babies, infants face some very important faces, mothers face, right. for example. Yeah, there was actually, wasn't there actually um, supposedly evidence that infants are entrained on faces even, even from within the womb? I've heard evidence recently that if you show an infant two dots and a line versus a line and two dots, even from within the womb, it's going to track the, the face-like thing and, and not the, the inverted image. So anyways, there's, there's probably something innate for face tracking. I didn't even know their eyes were open. They're not. <laughs> Here's another related question that they asked, and I think it's all in the same category. Why focus on the cases of impaired function? Notice we've done that in what we've said. Right. Constantly, we've, we've gone back to impaired functioning as sort of the key to understanding modules. Right. So the work of cognitive neuropsychology as a subdiscipline of cognitive science is specifically focused on impairment cases in helping us to deduce functional localization. And when it comes to understanding in so much as a particular brain function is functionally localizable within the brain, to get the kind of dissociation you need to be able to draw that conclusion, you essentially need to have impairment study. Now, the other side of this, of course, is that when you do this kind of work of functional localization based on impairment, this is going to rule out the alternative hypothesis, right? In order to get the kind of dissociation you need to conclude that a specific area has a certain function, you do need to be able to essentially knock out that area and see that that function goes away. That's what you need in order to conclude that a specific area has a certain function. But but on the other hand, when you're doing cognitive neuropsychology, when you're doing this kind of lesion study, it also rules out the other alternatives. The other side of that is that it rules out any kind of cognitive function that is distributed or that is plastic. So that kind of experimental procedure is going to be blind to any kind of cognitive function that isn't modular, that isn't localized in that sense. That isn't modular, that's right. It'll only work for those. Yeah. Won't work for those. Yeah, one of the nicest cases of highly specialized parts of the brain is the hippocampus, which is a piece of the cortex that's sort of folded under on both sides. When that's lost, people have specifically very impaired memory functions. At least humans do. You ever watched Memento? Right, Memento is, is the movie to watch. It's about hippocampal damage and an individual who's been unable to form new memories. So they remember up to a certain point at which they have a traumatic brain injury to the hippocampus, and then from that point onward, they're not able to form up to memories. The point when their hippocampus is lost. Yeah. They just don't get any new ones. And there are real life case studies of hippocampal damage that have resulted in the same kind of functional deficits, right? Mm -hmm. We now know him as Henry Mollison, but before his actual name was released, we knew him just as patient HM, and he did have a bilateral medial temporal lobectomy, which basically cut out the function of his hippocampus. Both? Yes, bilaterally, both sides. Um, which did result in that kind of functional deficit where he was able to remember episodic events up until the point that he had that brain surgery, but past that point was not able to record new episodic memory. He was able to learn tasks in a way. New skills. He was able to acquire new skills, like he was able to do certain kinds of games or puzzles, and he would get progressively better at those kinds of games or puzzles without forming any kind of recollection of it. So, so you'd ask him, did you play this game before? Have you ever played this game before? He would say, no. 50th time playing the game, 100th time playing the game. He would say, I've never played this game before, but he would get better and better and better at it. So there was some kind of memory that was being preserved, but it was not episodic memory in the sense of being able to look back on an experience that you've had 
you can, you can think of episodic memory as a capacity to remember episodes in your life. Where were you on whatever event was salient for you? People always people who were who are old enough all know where they were on September 11th, and they can tell you the story. Most of you weren't aren't old enough to remember that, I suppose. <laughs> You'll remember where you were this time, right now. You'll remember 10 years from now where you were dur during the pandemic. The idea here is that we've got two different kinds of memory. We've got episodic memory and declarative memory. So declarative memory would be something like, who was president in 2010? You might say Barack Obama was president in 2010. And that's a fact. A declarative memory is a memory of a, of a particular fact. Or what color car did your mother drive when you were seven years old? It was green. That's a declarative memory. But then you might have a specific memory of seeing your mother come into the driveway in her green car. Or you might have a specific memory of the inauguration of President Obama in 2008. And these are episodic memories. It's a little film reel in your head. And these also seem to come apart to some degree. They both involve yep. the hippocampus, but are to some degree localizable. Is that right? Yeah. Well, not declarative memories don't appear to be localizable. Except they're in the brain <laughs> somewhere. They're often formed in distributed form. We don't know. People often think this is the, that this tells us that the hippocampus is where memories are, memories are. It doesn't tell us that. It's just a device that stores memories somewhere else in your brain. And it's involved you know that in retrieving them too, right? Uh, yeah, except the people can, except hippocampal patients can recover memories from before before the loss, even though they don't have a hippocampus. Right. Tim could, could recount his childhood, but he couldn't tell you anything about the last 10 minutes. Right. So it's sort of like you're going to make a memory and the hippocampus takes that and puts it somewhere and gives it a little address so you can then go retrieve that memory. That's right. That's a nice case, though, of a very localized function in human beings. It doesn't work quite the same in other mammals. We had another question about modularity and the Shepard and Metzler 1971 image rotation. And the question there was, doesn't this necessitate a modular view of mental rotation? And my answer to that was, no, I don't think it does. I don't think it does either. It's a, it's a behavioral experiment. It was just a, a psychological experiment. It's just a behavioral experiment. So we're not really able to say anything about what parts of the brain might or may not be involved in that kind of experiment. However, later on, people did start to go in and try to do brain localizing of, of mental imagery stuff. And they found that what was involved was a lot of, of course, the, the visual stream, etc. But also, surprisingly, or maybe unsurprisingly, motor areas were activating. So when you had a, an object and it was in your mind's eye, it was being turned around in order to, to match it against another image, as in the Shepard and Metzler experiment, you were actually seeing motor areas activated as though you were really taking that object in your hand and turning it around. It was CAT scans. Yeah, I think that was, that was a Vorschläger experiment that that found that it was involving motor areas. Among others. Yeah. Also, all the whole visual stream gets engaged as well. Right. So it's a lot of areas for, for yes. this kind of mental rotation task. There's a lot of crosstalk between a lot of different areas. And when there's a lot of crosstalk, that generally makes it very hard to count it as modular. Specifically because we've defined modularity in terms of domain-specific areas that aren't sharing information with one another. So this, this informational encapsulation component tells us that this little area deals with this specific information and has this specific output. And anytime you have a kind of complex feedback looping of a, of a lot of different brain networks sharing information with each other, that rules out modularity because it confounds the informational encapsulation component. Yep, that's one reason people like to emphasize informational encapsulation and domain specificity, as Mel's sort of suggesting. They tend to go together to some extent. Last of your questions, how would supporters yeah. of the massive modularity hypothesis program artificial intelligence to fit their perspective? That, was, that wasn't just my question. It was questions that you guys asked. I think the answer is, if instead of 
trying to build very smart general purpose computers, you build a bunch of expert systems. So you might have one that does one thing and one and another that does another and a third does a third thing. Then you could hook them all together if you wanted. But each of those computer systems would be expert systems tailored to a specific test. So one might be concerned with mathematical functions. One might be concerned with trying to parse grammars. One might be concerned with visual recognition. If you just build those expert systems and then hook them together, then you've got something like a modular structure. There's another image that I'd like to find for this that has a little critter walking around that's got all these little bits that are each little domain specific components that all hook up together in a little sequence to give you the right kind of behavioral output. GPS and Turing are non-modular. Turing, Turing machine, the Turing machine is supposed to be a universal machine, remember, right? What that meant was it could do anything given the right programming. Right, right. So when it comes to um, modular versus um, versus non-modular versus distributed um, AI systems. Most of what we're doing today is at least in terms of um, neural networks, that's, that's non-modular. Connectionist networks are non-modular. It's just you've got this vast network and you've got different hierarchical levels so it's, it's divided, it's, it has structure in and of itself. It has internal structure, but that internal structure, all of it is doing every kind of functional thing. And we don't know what is doing what. We just give it inputs and we get an output, but we have no idea what bits are doing what. And in a lot of ways, brain function is also like this. You've got networks that have some kind of internal structure, have some kind of hierarchical organization, but you give it inputs and you get output and there's there's no knowing what happened in between and there's no looking to a specific part of it and, and parsing out what that does. That's right. And so with the Shepard and Metzler experiment, as things rotate, there isn't any place in the brain that's doing all the rotation. It's, it's, it's a it's function everything. of a, a kind of fast fast-paced conversation between a lot of different brain networks at once. Yep. Um, someone had asked, can brains have elements of both modularity and central processing? And the answer is sort of yes, and they do. Yep. They don't have central processing in the sense of there's one commanding area of your brain, like there's a little homunculus in your brain telling all the other brain areas what to do. There's no single place in your brain where you can find you. There's no single place in your brain where you can find something that's governing over the behavior of all the other brain networks. But it's also not as though the brain is uh, just a, a grab bag of informationally encapsulated Legos. There's a lot of conversation going on. And there are some parts of the brain. There are areas and functional networks within the brain that are doing more heavy lifting than other areas. If you if you map the whole brain, it's it has a scale-free property in the sense that there are some areas areas of the brain that are um, more in control than other areas. Or you can think of them as more connected. Right. So the prefrontal cortex, for example, is doing a lot of heavy lifting. Anytime you're doing something that you're in control of, that you're aware of, that you're, you're conscious of, that involves online processing, so to speak, that involves yeah. you making decisions in real time and, and processing data in real time and being aware of that sort of executing functions in real time on that. Um, that's going to involve the, the PFC, the prefrontal cortex, because that's your executive functioning area. That's correct. Same thing is true at the other end. The stuff in the back of your brain in the occipital lobe is more, more tightly involved in visual processing than other parts, but almost the whole brain gets involved gets engaged at one level or another in, in just dealing with simple visual processing, like, like looking at the, the shelves behind Mel and trying to figure out what's on them. Yeah, most most day-to-day -day tasks involve a lot of areas of the brain all jabbering at each other. And there is going to be some degree of functional specificity in that, well, this is the visual area and this is the auditory area. There's some degree of, of this is the kind of information that's processed here and this is the kind of information that's processed here. But then there's all this crosstalk and any kind of remotely complicated day-to-day -day task, and almost all of our day-to-day -day tasks are quite complicated, involves 
a lot of brain areas and a lot of crosstalk. Yes. The counterexample to modularity that Fodor had in mind was central processing. He has a vendetta against central processing. But nowadays, when we think of what's the alternative to modularity, we think of two things, and these are distributed cognition and neuroplasticity. And I think we'll get more into that later on in the course. We may come back to it a bit. The basic idea is nowadays we have a sense that some brain stuff at some level of abstraction is is somewhat modular and a lot of brain stuff at other levels of abstraction is highly distributed in the sense yeah. that there are lots of areas involved in it so you you have some functional process some cognitive tasks some phenomenon and that's involved in a lot of areas of the brain and that it's highly plastic that a lot of brain functions are highly plastic they grow into their functions they can trade off their functions and if some other area loses a function, that area can pick up functional slack. It can chime in to pick up what was left off by the area that is out of commission. And Michael Anderson has a book called After Phrenology that's a very compelling case for distributed and plastic cognition. Right. And he has this theory called TALONS. It's an acronym for transiently assembled local networks. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So some neurons will get together and do something over here. And then there's another functional task. And many of those same neurons involved in the original task are going to be repurposed, rewired in a new way for some other task moments later. So neurons are playing many different roles. They're wearing many different hats in many different kinds of functional activities, is the idea there. Yeah, so you read the functions not off particular groups of neurons, but over the, the over, but more over the pattern within the brain. Memories are like that. They don't, there doesn't seem to be any particular place where any particular memories are stored. Jerry Fodor used to say, there is no grandma neuron. There's no neuron you could go in and point it and, it, and you lose your memory of your grandmother. In that sense, we'd say that knowledge and memories and experiences, these things are Quinean. If you remember from the, from the Bermudez reading, he invokes Quinean to refer to something that's holistic in nature because the philosopher mm -hmm. Willard Van Orman Quine had a notion of how our beliefs and how our knowledge worked as being highly integrated so that there's no singling out a single component of our knowledge knowledge or a single component of our experience. It's all integrated and each piece relies on the whole web of other pieces. So we've covered all the questions I sort of extracted from the worksheets. Have we gotten most of yours? There was some question about why is it difficult to evolve cooperation and asking for examples of why defector punishment would... Ah, uh, we yeah. haven't said anything about it much, to, much, much at all. Um, I guess the basic idea there is that there are these class of games that we deal with in evolutionary game theory, and the prisoner's dilemma, which you dealt with in the reading, is, is one such game. And the idea there is that with evolutionary games like prisoner's dilemma or stag hunt or hawk dove or what have you is that it's meant to mathematically show us how you can get the evolution of some cooperative social behavior under the assumption that it's difficult to get that off the ground why is it difficult to get that off the ground specifically because if you have a lot of defectors or cheaters, individuals in a population. You have a population of individuals, and most of them are freeloaders. Most of them are taking advantage of the other players. It's hard to get someone cooperative in there. If someone cooperative invades that population, they're going to die off because they're going to be taken advantage of by all the defectors. So it's, it's a game of getting cooperation off the ground under the assumption that it's difficult to get off the ground. In these kinds of evolutionary games, we're assuming that every individual organism is only interested in their own fitness. That's a sort of basic assumption of, of Darwinian natural selection as applied to these kinds of, as, as we see it play out in these kinds of games. At least that's the way it, got, it gets portrayed. Right. It's actually an economist's game. 
it's it's the games that economists play when they try to figure out what it's right what is rational or irrational to do on cooperation that goes with evolutionary psychology in many ways i'm not very sympathetic with evolutionary psychology but here's one thing that they're right about that is that we're completely social animals that if there's anything that's a key to understanding the way humans work you have to recognize that we're social animals we aren't selfish automata that work for our own best interests we work in teams, we work in groups, we identify with groups. We identify some people as in-group and some people as out-group. Some people are different, some people are the same. And the same, the ones who are the same are the ones you want to cooperate with. The same in terms of willingness to, to cooperate. cooperate, typically. So you don't want to you don't want to cooperate with someone who's not going to help you out. Why? Because the assumption, again, is that individual organisms only care about cooperation, about helping others, if in a roundabout way it, it helps their own fitness, if in a roundabout way it's, it's useful. So being selfless, being altruistic, being cooperative is only useful if it helps our selfish needs in the long run. That's, that's the assumption in, in evolutionary game theory. Um, and so when I asked for an example, I was trying to come up with an example, I thought maybe a group, but you've got a troop of chimpanzees, and you've got a bunch of them that go out on a hunt, and maybe there are 20 hunters in this troop, and each time they go out on a hunt, there's a cohort of like five of them that goes out on the hunt. And of these 20 adults that are good at hunting, five and five and five keep going out, different configurations, but there's one of them that almost never goes out to hunt, and yet he keeps taking lots of food. The idea is that a, a defector or a freeloader like that, someone who's not willing to help out, is going to be detected by the group, or it's beneficial for the group or for individuals within the group to be able to detect such an individual and to punish him, it's called defector punishment, to punish him as if he's not uh, doing his fair share of the labor. Yep, he gets shunned, Booted he doesn't get the benefit of the group. Or at least when it comes time to, to divvy out the results of the hunt, no one's going to let him get in on the food because he's not doing his fair share. This is fairly common in lots of animal species, by the way. But it's certainly that this happens, in fact, with chimpanzee troops, the, the common chimps. It also happens plenty with... Plenty of primates, plenty of birds. Other, lots of other animals. It's even well known among bats. Yes. The vampire yeah. bats will share blood, but they'll only share blood with others that shared blood with them or with their relative. Yeah, um, vampire bats are very nice to each other. They're highly cooperative. So you get a, a troop of vampire bats in a cave and these bats will die if they don't get blood every 48 hours. They drink blood. And so to make sure everyone survives, these bats, ones that are successful in their acquisition of blood, will go back and will vomit blood in the mouths of their friends, as friends do. But if one of these bats is not doing its fair share, he or she is not going to get blood donation. Right. Networks there, it works with chimpanzees. It works with lots of creatures that do things cooperatively. But cooperation comes naturally. That's the insight that the evolutionary psychologists had. And that's why cheater detection is important, because cheater detection allows you to bind the group together. At first, we would just look at one-off prisoner's dilemma. And when you look at just one-off prisoner's dilemma, the rational choice is always to defect. The rational choice is always to give up your partner, to not cooperate. But when you do an iterative prisoner's dilemma and you're able to acquire information about the behavior of the other player, what emerges as the evolutionary stable strategy is in fact cooperate at first and then after that tit for tat, do what the person playing opposite you does, mirror their behaviors. So you get a kind of non-cooperative view if you just look at the one-off prisoner's dilemma, but when you get the, the iterative prisoner's dilemma that goes sequentially and you can gain information about your opponent, then you see a cooperative strategy emerge. You can see how cooperation can get off the ground. Yeah, to fill out this topic would, would take us very far afield. That's one reason we didn't emphasize it very much up until now, but, some, but many of you asked about 
about it, so we thought we'd better erase it. All right. That seems to be it. Yep. We'll have another worksheet up for you on Thursday. Excellent. And that will be due by the end of the day, Sunday. We'll yep. talk to you again next Tuesday. Again, if there's anything that you'd like us to elaborate on, that you didn't feel was covered, if we didn't answer your question, if we didn't adequately answer your question, please talk to us about that in the forums, which will be up on Blackboard. And have a good week.